Hello everyone, it's Izzy here from Izzy Sandpit TV. I hope you're enjoying the content. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. I'm also available on all these streaming services. So, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Today I've got Jack, the drummer from FIDA and formerly of Big Linda. Jeff has worked with some major artists over the years, such as Simply Red. He's worked with S Club 7. We catch up about all sorts, the new feeder album, the new tour, and also what it was like working with some of those other big musicians. I hope you enjoyed the chat. Good afternoon everyone, welcome to Izzy Sandpit TV, I'm Izzy and today on the channel I've got Jeff, formerly of Big Linda and now of Feeder. Hi Jeff. Hi. Hi, <laughs> how are you doing man? How's it going? Good. All right, thanks. Yeah, just a uh, lovely day in London here. Yeah, I can just show you. Oh, let's have a look. Oh, look it is that. lovely. Oh, look up the trees as well. No, you know, it's, it's nice for it being 20 degrees outside, but I do miss those nice, dry, crisp evenings or crisp yeah, evenings in the UK. It's definitely that time of year. Spring is coming. Spring is on its way. So the warm weather will yeah. soon be with you for three weeks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, Jeff, thanks. Thanks for coming on. Um, welcome to my channel. Um, so first, we'll, we'll, we'll chat about what you're currently doing, which is in Feeder. So you've been in Feeder since 2016. Um, how are you enjoying it? Oh yeah, it's great. Uh, you know, um, it's been, uh, it was quite a sort of last minute thing. Uh, Carl called me up, you know, uh, with about a month or three weeks before the uh, Albright Electric tour and said, I can't do this uh, and everything else that I'm doing because he's so busy, that guy. And he said, do you, can you, is it, you know, do you want to have a, go, a crack at it? And uh, we're good friends. Uh, uh, and uh, I said, oh God, you, you, well, when, when does it start? You know, and he said, well, it's about, it's about, it's, it's three weeks time, you know, so I was like, shit. But uh, anyway, I quickly uh, got, work, got got to work and learned as much stuff as I could and um, went into rehearsals and uh, met the guys and we, we, we clicked really quickly. And um, yeah, it's been great. It's been great fun. They're lovely guys, every, all five of us, actually. There's five of us on stage, uh, yeah. even though mainly Grant Tacker. But uh, uh, when we go out, there's five people and uh, it, it's a great experience and uh hope that we're making a nice noise <laughs> no do you know what one of my uh, favorite songs uh, to, to listen to and it always reminded me of sort of the old kerrang tv is just the day you know the one where it's in all the rooms and it, it's yeah. a great it's a great feeder a, a sort of a, a what you would call a classic british rock band you know they've survived uh, a long time and they've been around a long time um, so fair play to them for, for being, you know, for just for in the music industry, you know, people come in and out all the time. So fair play to them for keep going and, and, you know, producing some good music. So, so your first album that you actually played on was Tallulah. Is that correct? Uh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So how was it with the recording process? How was it like recording the songs with Feeder? I know you've recorded with so many different artists over the years, but what was it like recording with the guys? How did you enjoy it? Was there a different style to what you were used to or, you know, what was it like? Yeah. What's it like? Um, well, it's, it's great. I mean, um, Grant basically comes in with everything pretty much finished. Um, he's got, you know, he's got everything worked out how he wants, uh, how he wants it to be. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of the, well, most of the guitars and um, sometimes even the bass is done, and then the drums right. go on at the books a, a studio for a couple of days, and then we go in and smash out quite a lot of tracks. I mean, <laughs> it's not like one a day or two. It's it's like, I mean, in the last recording session, I think we did we did about five a day, um, yeah, which is a lot. Right. Um, it's a lot of work, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, to get yeah, because you got to get definitive definitive parts. Uh, um, you're not just sort of like sketching them out. So that, to no. get, but anyway, uh, on the on the Toluda, I think it was we did two or three a day, um, and uh, th I think we three of them that I did ended up on that record. Uh, Youth, Daily Habit, and uh, Rodeo, I think it was. Right. Uh, yeah, and Rodeo. we did them down at the Fifth Factory. 
yeah, we did them down at this place called the Fish Factory, which is in Wilsdon, which is a fantastic um, studio run by an Italian, uh, Antonio, I think his name is. Um, and uh, it's an API uh, desk, which is an American sort of equivalent of the Neve. Uh, and he's got tons and tons of old school outboard gear uh wow. old microphones old he's a drummer so he's got loads of drum kit i didn't need to take drums down but i did <laughs> uh but i didn't need to because he's got so many fantastic old vintage kits down there yeah and um yeah we got a went down there with grant and tim and uh bashed them out in a couple of days and that was my first uh time with them so i was a little bit sort of um you know oh no i don't want to say nervous but i was uh just you know, when you work with different people, everybody has their own way of working. Yeah. So I was interested to see how, you know, how how it how Grant worked, and uh, he works hard. That's how he works. He works really no, hard. <laughs> absolutely, and I can imagine that you know, obviously, as he's the sort of the main contributor of the musical inf- musical direction of Fido, it must be. Yeah. It must be different. Certainly, going working in as a session musician, or you know, working in as a musician, than being the you know sort of part of the creative energy that is because again i've I've got another chat that's coming up in a a couple of days that's it's already been recorded and the uh graham from cradle of filth the guitarist uh, so richard Richard, yeah richard shaw from cradle of filth is coming on and he talks about that uh, danny (coughs) phil is very much collaborative and wants them all to write it whereas as you've got grant that comes in and gives you all the bits and then you add in your drum parts so it's amazing how different musicians work so differently, you know. Yeah. Um, so well, he, he Grant actually comes up with a lot of the. He has very sort of set ideas of drums as well, you know. He, wow. He knows what he Play likes. Drums as well. Uh, then. No, he's, he's. I've never seen him sit down behind the drums ever. Actually. Not uh, even, even to pick out Seven Nation Army. <laughs> no, he's never done it. I've ne- you know, he's, I'm just trying to think. Actually, I don't think you know. In re- usually in rehearsal room, everybody yeah. gets up on everything. I like to go and play guitar, bass, whatever's around. You know, just have a have a have a go. You know, but he's he's, he's never done it. In fact, I'm going to ask him to play it. I'm going to go. Come on, let's do it. get him to do the old Phil Collins. You know, I can uh, call it in the air tonight. In the air tonight. Ah, absolutely no. When whenever I've been in the studio, I've always had a little go on the drums, but I am I've got horrendous rhythm. I can't dance. I can sing, thankfully. Uh, I can play a bit. I can play guitar to a, an okay level, but I can't play drums because I've got no rhythm whatsoever, Jeff. So <laughs> it's just wow. yeah, it's, it's terrible. But um, so you've got the new album coming out. Is it Torpedoes this year? How many Torpedo, songs? Yeah. How many songs are you featured on that one? What can you tell me much about the album? What's it like? Is it sound? Is it heavier? Is it lighter? Is it you know? Yeah, it's a heavy. It's a heavy one. Um, uh, I mean, I think the ones that have been released out into the into the world so far, people have the comments have been like, "Oh, it's like going back to the uh, the nineties again, old school yeah. feeder." You know, like the swim and the uh, you know the Echo Park sort of time. Yeah. Um, uh which is which is great i mean that's what grant wanted to achieve on this one i think he wanted to you know he, he's he got feeders of him are sort of several it's not just one sound it's it's no. obviously there's this there's this anthemic song side absolutely and yeah. then, there's, then there's the rocks you know the the rock side you know because he's a you know he's a he's a big old school 70s classic rock fan um uh so he, you know, but also he likes writing catchy pop songs, you know, no, which absolutely. which are very catchy. Yeah, yeah. So, that know, shows, it's, shows all, music. it's all coming together on this one. Uh, there are there are there's a lot of the, there's a lot of anthemic choruses going on, but there's a lot of riffs and hefty old switching through the gears half time. Uh, uh, you know, hefty rock riffs. Yeah, as well. Some good breakdowns. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> and I think. Uh, Carl and me are 50 50 on this one. He's, yeah. he's 50 and I'm yeah, so which how, is great. Just just focusing on that little bit, how does your style, Jeff, compare to Carl's? Could you give me a, a slight difference? So if someone that hasn't listened to the is it, when they listen to the new album and they how could they separate your drums from Carl's? 
I'd be interested to know on that one. Well, mine are the badly played out time <laughs> ones. And his is a, <laughs> his that's is not true. Played. You know that's <laughs> No, I mean, well, I can't. I mean, he's he, he, it's very difficult appearing on a record with him because he's so good. I mean, he's he's uh, he's one of the finest um, drummers out there, I think, uh, in the world uh, right now, as far as uh, as you know, playing 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 songs and and yeah. um, and playing the music. He's a fantastic listener. You know, he's got a and he's got an infectious groove. You know, a beautiful touch. I saw him the other night. Actually, went down. Uh, he was playing with James Blunt uh, in Wembley. And he and he gave me a call. Said, "Do you want to come down?" So I took my my wife out on the, our first date in about five years. We've got two children, so we never go out. No, we don't leave the house. We don't leave the <laughs> but uh, so we, I took her down there, and um, yeah, he played uh, in Wembley with James, and it was he was fantastic. You know, he's That's just uh, he's a beautiful player. Um, so uh, I, I mean, you know, as far as how you compare us, everybody's different. You know, every, every no one sounds the same. The, you know, everybody has their own way of here particularly drummers you know that they um because they, they, their job is putting the back beat the you know the punctuation in the in the river of time as bill bruford yeah. used to call it the, steam um, train. the time is traveling like this and, and, yeah. and drummers put their kick there and their snare there and the hi-hat somewhere in between and the the greatest drummers uh have the best way of uh communicating that you know the top five whatever the top five are uh, I've got my top five, but uh, people like Stuart Copeland, you know, he has this unique way of putting the kick snare and hi hat, you know, which makes the police sound as, you know, I mean, police were a great band, but Stuart Copeland makes them a, a, an all time great, you know, just because he's just so unique. Same with John Bonham, same with um, a guy called Phil Gould, is another one of my all time favorite, level 42 original drummer, yeah. had just amazing t- pocket, you know, the, the just where he puts the kick and snare and hi hat, the relationship yeah, of those three sounds, absolutely. and then put them, puts them in the in the music. It it just creates this. Uh, so no one sounds the same. Um, so as far as comparing me and Carl, you know, we're, we're we're different, but we we've got a lot of people that similar people that we yeah. that listen to and admire. Uh, awesome. It's, and uh, talk about distinctive drummers, yeah. and probably. I would say that his drumming style is quite a simple drumming style. It was Ed Graham from The Darkness? It's oh yeah, very simple rock and roll drums, but he really complimented that band. You know, so yeah, 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 yeah. I, I get that. I really do. I do get that. So, so you have you've worked with other musicians. You've worked with Mick Hucknall. You've worked with S Club Seven. The not drop in. You've worked with Atomic Kitten, Mick Hucknall. How was it working with those guys? You know, give me some little memories from your time working with those musicians. Oh uh, God, yeah. I mean, uh, simply read uh, the producer Andy Wright. I was, I was the way I met him was uh, I was in a band. I came to London for Brighton. I used to live in Brighton. Hmm. And I was in this sort of uh, Brazilian funk fusion band uh, <clears throat> thing down there, which played regularly, and then. And then uh, through by way of my brother getting a gig with a pop artist up here, he was a scratchy, scratchy DJ kind of yeah. hip hop scratchy. Though. I ended up moving to um, London uh, because I knew that was what I had to do. Um, and then I got this band, which is sort of like a, a sort of uh, uh, an, an indie sort of alt rock band. And we had a little rehearsal room and I was in there one day practicing on my own. And then this head came around the door uh, and it was uh, Andy Wright. I did. I didn't know who he was at the time. And he said, "I've just been listening to you outside. Are you available for uh, sessions?" And I thought, I said, "Yeah, yeah." Who's you know? And it actually, the the one he wanted me to do was um, Natalie and Brulia's first album. Um, right. Remember the girl off Neighbours? Yeah. And he said, "Can you get down to Mayfair Studios next Tuesday? Uh, I'm doing. I'm producing Natalie and Brulia's album." And I thought, "Wow, this is <laughs> my, it. This my is time, eh, Jeff." What's that? It said right place, right time. Right, right place, right time, exactly. So that was the kind of, that was, if there was ever a point where it started, it was there because I ended up having a great relationship with Andy who did all the Simply Red stuff and S Club and all the other stuff. But, but the first thing, thing we did was Natalie Brunner's first record, a couple of tracks on that. Uh, I didn't do Torn. 
uh, the big hit. That was Chuck Saber, I think. Right. But uh, <clears throat> I ended up on that album. I think it's I think it sold like 13 million copies or something. But I didn't get a credit, unfortunately. Oh, so, no, that's a shame. It was, I know they, they didn't credit me, but I am on that record, and, uh, and we that know. was the first. Uh, and it's been you know. immortalised on Izzy Sampit TV. So there you go, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the first thing, and then, uh, and then I, I, you know, me and Andy struck a great uh, relationship together, and he started calling me for pretty much everything he did. And one of those things was uh, simply Red, and I used to get asked in to do various bits and pieces on various albums. I think it's about five records I've done uh, bits and bobs on. <laughs> yeah, and then the S Club, uh, <clears throat> we would. What he used to do was he used to, we'd be in Studio A at Metropolis and it'd be paid for by a big uh, artist. And uh, and then he'd, he'd he'd get me to play the, the track that we were paid, for, paid to do. And then he'd sort of throw me a load of demos that he's, or artists that he was working on. Yeah, and he'd go, could quickly just do a quick take on this? Or can you just do some percussion on that? Or what do you think of this? Do some drums on this. Uh, play some piano on this, you know, you know play a bit of piano as well. Um, so, uh, we, uh, well, he's a very good piano player as well. Um, but if you wanted silly piano, he'd come to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> and then one day we were in uh, West Point uh, uh, and we were doing one of his um, uh, people that he paid for. Uh, it was like developing an artist called Ryan Malloy, I think it was, uh, who ended up singing the, the, the lead, uh, the, in the Jersey Boys, the lead, yeah, Frankie I, Valley. I, I, I recognise the name, but I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then, uh, and then somebody came down and and they said, "Quick, can you can you have a look at this band, uh, this this pop thing that uh, Simon Fuller, I think, was managing? Was it Simon Fuller? Might have. I think it was. Um, anyway, it turned out to be S Club Seven, and <laughs> it was the first track to bring it all back. And uh, we put it was on the tape. They had it was on tapes back then. It was still we were still in tape world. Ah, and, um, those are the days. Good old scene. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and, and uh, we listen, I listened to it, and I thought, Jesus, that's the number one if I ever heard it. Uh, and uh, it was, I thought it was ABC by the Jackson Five, fused with Birdland Weather Report. Because if you think about it, <laughs> yeah, it goes, it goes, don't stop, never give up. Ba, ba, da, da. So you got da 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 and ABC. Well, the oh, yeah. those together. <laughs> you know, so uh, I just basically went in there and did a, a, a version of uh, ABC by Jackson Five. I kind of thought, well, that's the vibe. So, and then, and then it, you know, the rest is history. Basically. The rest is history because it's funny because my partner, <laughs> she, she loves all. We we both like those sort of. I'm gonna say it. Those cheesy hits on like lists on on Spotify, and every time that comes on, I think of you, and then I think of now I'm gonna think of the Jackson Five or that you know Jackson it's, Five. Yeah, it's, well, I mean it's, it's very well written stuff. It is, know, but, and that's why pop. I know that pop gets a bit of a knock, and I'm not a big pop fan at times, but sometimes you just your classic '90s and noughties cheesy pop. It's just it's just it just sticks in your head and yeah, you know, it's great. So no, that's a really yeah. interesting little story that, and yeah. And it was just, uh, it was just tagged on at the end of the day. We were then, it, we started, I started doing recording about six, seven in the evening and it was like a couple of takes and it was done. Um, the and then it went off to by extent to be mixed and then <laughs> awesome. there you go. Yeah. There you go. And the rest is history. I, I, yeah. How many plays, how, how, how many plays has Bring It On Back had by the uh, by S Club Seven? Let's have a quick look. S Club Seven, Bring It On Back, eighty-two million on Spotify. Ah. Eighty-two million people yeah. have listened to your drumming alone on that one, Jeff. So there you go. Awesome. There you go. <laughs> so the Rolls just... Royce ha is not parked outside, unfortunately. No, <laughs> because of Spotify. <laughs> it's okay. Spotify, very naughty. Very no, naughty yeah, man. Absolutely. Yes, no, no, uh, absolutely. We're, we won't go into that one, though, shall we? <laughs> no, no. Can if you want. <laughs> no. Okay, go on then. So, what's. I, I'm, not, I'm not usually one to dig the. I, I don't think the. the they, they pay the musicians a fair amount. I think 0.0032p is, 
is is the is, paying musicians anything? So no. the writers get anything. Uh, the whole, you know, it, it's uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. They, they you pay you ten pounds a month, uh, and that all gets collected and then gets given to Joe Rogan. Uh, while the so all the people go on there to listen to music, and then they musicians end up paying Joe Rogan. I know it's horrendous. It's it's quid. Especially, I, it, it's the fact that, and I would like to say to all my watchers that I am neither. At the end of the day, I've got my opinions on 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 COVID, and I've got, but I won't voice them here. But at the end of the day, if you're spreading lies about things, you've got to be very, very careful on what you're doing. Yeah, you can have your saying. own. You can have your. You can have your yeah. own opinion, but you can't, you can't have your own. Absolutely, facts, you know? no, exactly, <laughs> and, and that's it. And for me, that that's where the line draws. You know, you you've got to differentiate what people are, where there's a fact and. And there's the lies, and that's the problem is the misinformation out there. So, you know, those people check your facts, check your facts. He was arguing with a, he was arguing, I Googled he, was, he, was argue, he was arguing with a medical, there was a, a, like a, a trained, uh, qualified scientist on his show, and they were talking about one of the side effects. And the scientist says, No, that's that's not true. And the scientist was give, giving his uh, sort of, you know, well researched, uh, 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 facts to joe rogan and he's you know, he's going no that's not true because look and then he's he's googling it so his research is just go, you know google and the problem with google it makes everybody bloom an expert and uh yeah absolutely my, and my best friend is a my be, one of my best friends is a surgeon um yeah you know he you know, I've, i always go to him with any kind of you know and people are like oh the masks don't work i go to my surgeon friend said do they work and he says yes they do work that's why i wear one that's why we all have to wear one and uh, no, absolutely. You know, my go to guy for medical stuff because I'm not an expert, but he is. So, and uh, well, he I've did got 10 a, years of, you know, I've got a food science degree, years. so I've got, a, I've got a BSc, but it's in food science. But I still go and check the facts in the correct places if I want to present some information. So, yeah, yeah so, so people don't get your information from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, yeah. and also check where your Google facts are, you know, check. Get a Google. mate who's done uh, 15, 10, 15 years, plus then another 20 years experience yeah. in surgery. Ask him. But I'm going to, I'm going to believe, I'm going to believe Sharon who read it off Facebook because her mate told her that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a slippery wicket, man. It's a slippery. It so, so back on to, to, to music as such back to music. slipped into the Joe Rogan thing. Or I didn't want to, but we'll, we'll, we'll stick with it in terms of you've got the tour coming up in, uh, in April, May, and then you've got the Noel Gallagher support. That's going to be a big one. Are you looking forward to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you, are, are you ready for it? Or are you, are you currently practicing? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm work, you know, I'm building up, uh, cause we haven't played for, two and a half years. I mean, we did a couple of things here and there, but it was just like a one, a one off festival. One, yeah. uh, we did like four, four festivals in the summer, I think. Um, and they were sort of spread out and it was just the old stuff. But as far as the new stuff goes, yeah, we, we, I'm, we're all working on it. There's a lot of work to do. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, it's like, um, it's like bringing the, the flock of sheep. They're all, they're all out on the field. And I've got to bring them in into the pen. That's where that's where it's happening. <laughs> so uh, I can't leave one of them out there because then, yeah. you know it's, it's not as, so. So I'm just currently herding, herding, herding the tunes, herding the tunes. Talking about COVID, how was it for two and a half years, Jeff? Of you know a lot of uncertainty oh. around what you do. Probably, um, did you manage to have things to fill in at home? You know, and record maybe on your own, or was it pretty? <clears throat> Pretty quiet. Well, I've got, I got, I got a family with uh, two children, uh, who were, you know, eleven and four at the moment, but they were nine and yeah. two uh, <clears throat> when it when it started. So uh, that took up uh, <clears throat> all the time here. Really, uh, I did get out and do a couple of recordings. Uh, one of them was the was the new feeder stuff. Um, uh, but it was mainly just, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and trying to get out and exercise the kids, and just yeah. not go crazy. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there was no work. 
uh, there was no work. It, it obviously just finished. Um, okay. Literally, we, we were, the last gig we did was in Cologne, in Germany, uh, <clears throat> in November 2019, I think. And wow. then there was nothing until now. So that's a long time, Jeff. So I'm glad yeah. that hopefully things are moving in the right direction. Hopefully, yeah, uh, yeah. Touch yeah. wood. Touch wood. I'll touch some wood as well. So yeah. I've wanted to ask you this for a long time. Talk to me a little bit about, so for those that don't know on the channel, Jeff used to be in a band called Big Linda and Big Linda oh, yeah. were um, a rock band and they were awesome. If you haven't listened to I Loved You, their album from 2002? No, uh, later. Eight. 2008, yes. Well, Two thousand seven. We finished. Oh, hang on, it was 2008 because it, yeah. it came out of the, the year of the crash. Yeah. If you haven't listened to it, buy it. Find it somewhere and and listen to it because it's, it's an Spotify. amazing album. So uh, is there any chance of you guys getting back together and satisfying my Big Linda, my Big Linda fantasy and getting Big <laughs> Linda out of the closet again? <laughs> Well, it's no, I don't think so. I think <clears throat> we 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 did actually uh, we did one of the things that we did uh, recording wise. Paul Stacey, uh, who mixed Big Linda and sort of co-produced it, um, he he called me and Patrick up and said, "I've got this weird request." Uh, he he used to have this mixing desk called a Trident A Rage. Now they're really rare. Uh, it came out of Chipping Norton studio, so we had hundreds of famous uh, classic records made on it. And then it went to Lenny Kravitz in America, and he bought it off Lenny Kravitz. And I think there's only about ten of them ever made. Wow. And the parts cost uh, a fortune on that to replace. <laughs> well, you can't replace them. Yeah, they they, they stop making. You know, you can't get them. And yeah. The Trident A range is particularly. It's, it's like one of those, uh, you know, greatest of all. Of, it, of all time mixing this. Yeah. Anyway, he he had that, and we mixed that album on that, uh, and recorded some extra bits on it in his old studio. Then he sold it, and he called up uh, a few months ago and said, "I've sold my desk to this place, and, they, and and it's not working out in the new uh, studio. Then we need to work out what's what's wrong with it, whether it's the desk or whether there's some kind of problem with the wiring or whether it's the room or whatever. So, can you come down?" with the Big Linda lads, record a couple of tracks and I'm going to move things around and we're going to work out by the process of elimination what's, what's wrong. And we, you know, you get paid for it. So so me, so unfortunately Vets is in Italy, Vets, you know, so he couldn't come. So I had to get another bass player, John Noyce, we used, who's absolutely fantastic. But it was me, Patrick and Rob. And we did uh, Get It While You Can and Wind Power, I think. Uh, yeah. And we, yeah, we did those two. And it's sad. Oh, we haven't played them. We haven't been together for 15, 12, 15 years or something. Yeah. And, uh, it did sound just as good as it ever did. Um, so it was, it was uh, and we, and the, there's nothing wrong with the desk. So if anybody wants to go to, Ken, uh, what's it called? It used to be Kenseltown Studio. It's fine. Um, <laughs> the desk works, uh, guys. The desk works. The desk works. <laughs> and it, it, it's a hell of a machine. It's, it really is. But, uh, but yeah, so uh, that's the only time we ever got back together. Unfortunately, uh, Italy's gone back. To, um, Vecchio's gone back to Italy, so yeah, uh, yeah he's over there. And he's, you know, and the singer's a be joiner. Thin. Didn't he leave Big Linda to be a joiner? He was training to be a joiner. Or that's the singer, Rob. The singer, Rob. Yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Is he still a joiner? Well, he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's a he's a carpenter. Yeah, yeah. Carpenter, sorry, so, it, carpenter. He left reason, to be a carpenter. The reason it, the reason it ended was uh, the 2008 crash kind of killed us. Uh, oh. it, it, the uh, the the head of Sony Music was uh, replaced by somebody else, and he wasn't and he wasn't really interested in sort of a classic rock band. So they, they, so the money sort of stopped yeah. coming our way. So we couldn't go on tours, and we couldn't afford it. So we had to go look for work anywhere elsewhere. Uh, so Pat, and me, and Vets sort of started doing session work, and was, we were always we, we, that was always in the background. And Rob, as a singer, he's he's not really, a, a, you know, he can't do any session stuff. So he had to look for yeah. for a job, and then he's trained as a carpenter, and then that was pretty much it, really. 
it, we it, did it, try it, a second album. Yeah. Um, we we went out to sawmills and we 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 came up with some amazing tracks, but uh, but Rob was a little dry on on uh, material. It's he was he, he wasn't really yeah. You know, he didn't he didn't have a focus down there. Nothing came of it, unfortunately. Well, so because yeah. it was a good it was a good honestly I, I I know I'll say it Jeff, but it was just a great album from start to finish. I don't even like you. Wind power, yeah. you know, uh, get it while you can. Oh, just, uh, it just all of it, and the big vocals, those echoey vocals on it, were just really good. And yeah, Rob, Rob's amazing vocalist. Yeah, he, 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 it's a shame, he, really. It's a shame. He, he was a complete natural. He he never warmed up or practiced or anything. He just went in, and that's what he did. Literally, first take, and when he came to do to you know, if he did double a vocal, he was. He was absolutely perfect. I've never seen anybody as consistent like him. Amazing yeah. singer. So get it while you can. Uh, actually, uh, that's the only time that was ever played. Um, it was just we just we were we were down at uh, Chris Stifford's place uh, in Rye. Uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Heliocentric, beautiful studio uh, owned by Chris Stifford of Squeeze. Uh, and we went down there and we were supposed to be recording something else and that wasn't really working we had this thing which we'd written and we were trying to and then Pat just started playing that riff as a kind of like oh I just want to play this for a bit and I just joined in and Vets joined in and get it while you can backing track not the vocal that was put on afterwards but the backing track that is the only time that was ever played it was never rehearsed before it was just bang that was just a jam and then Rob heard it and put the vocal on. You got to get it while you can. Yeah, it's just a complete jam. Awesome. And <laughs> another song classic off the album was I Don't, um, I Don't Even Like You. You know, yeah. how did that get written? Because that is just, just you know, it drops and it kicks back in with everything. Ah, dun -dun 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 -dun, and it goes, yeah. it's just, how did that one get written? I'm intrigued. Okay. That one was written the verse chords and melody i wrote that in my bed sit uh i was listening to slipknot uh yes and i got yeah there was a there was a slipknot melody da, 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 something like that i can't remember which track it was you remember slipknot they had the screen bit and then they yeah. had the nice melody bit yeah but it was a nice melody bit which i kind of got influenced by like and, and i got those chords on the guitar uh and then I and then we went into a rehearsal room and I said, lads, I've got this idea. And I sort of sang it down low. I didn't have any words or anything. And then uh okay, well let's try it. So so we started playing it and then uh and then Rob took it up an octave and then started coming up with words. And then we didn't have the next bit. Pat tried something and it something else and it just didn't seem to work so so we stopped had a break pat went to the toilet or something and then and then <clears throat> oh yeah then i was talking when we stopped i was telling this story about uh, a friend of ours who who was in a leap year on valentine's day the girl is allowed to ask the boy to marry him <laughs> Did you know that's this? amazing <laughs> so on, on a leap year on Valentine's Day, a girl is allowed to say, will you marry me to the boy? Apparently, this is some kind of, you know. Wow. Learn a new fact. <laughs> so, so there was a leap year a few years ago, and this friend of ours went out to dinner. Well, these two friends of ours went out to dinner, and, the, and she asked him, will you marry me? And then he sort yes. of like spat his, he spat his, you know, drink out and said, marry you? I don't even <laughs> like you. you. <laughs> I don't even like you. That's brilliant. So that's, I was telling that I was telling that story because I'd just heard it. Uh, you know, uh, and, in, and then and then this is in the break. And then Pat went to the toilet. Then he came back and he goes, "I know, I, I know the, I know how, I've got the chorus. What about da 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 da? I da 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 da. Even like, like so that became the chorus. We put the two together, and that was done. And then we played that's it at a gig that night for the first time, and it went off. It, it it went off and that yeah. song is it's 
I run, I run on the canal here by Dubai Canal. And yeah. I put it on the other week just towards, I was just having a little two minute rest and I thought, right, I'm going to kill this last, this last um, 500 meters or well, probably a bit more, but more like a mile. And I just remember listening to that song and when it kicks in at the end, it's just, it's just <clears> a great song. So yeah. sticking yeah. on, I don't even like you. Who wrote, whose idea was it for the video with the drinking, the tequila slammer drinking puppet? That was another bit of stroke of luck was, uh, uh, Rob's friend, uh, who was uh, at art college, was a massive uh, Jim Henson fan. You know the nice. Muppets crew. Yeah, uh, and, and he did. He basically, you know, was really into the kind of whole puppetry thing, and uh, he needed to do a project for his dissertation or something. No way. So, <laughs> so he said, "So he said, can I use your? I want to do a." video for that song I've got this character uh and, and can I use your song and, and, and I remember Rob coming down because we all shared a flat and he came and he said oh is it all right if my friend uses you know and we said yeah yeah sure didn't think anything of it and then it came to the, and then it and then it uh, you know a couple of months later or this DVD arrived he goes oh this is the uh the video should we watch it and we put it on we're like oh, look at this it's brilliant and then when it decided and then and then we got subsided and then you know it was like, well, we're going to release, we're going to release some singles, and then that became the single. It's like, okay, we need a video. Our manager said, we need a video. But I don't even like you, and we said, well, we've got one. We've got this, <laughs> and we played, and we played it to, to, to the, you know, brilliant. And they were like, they, felt, they you know, like, geez, this is fantastic. This, that's just dumb. So um, I think we did get it edited slightly differently or something, but yeah. uh, that was how that came about. Yeah, just to awesome. stroke of luck. That's so good. That is brilliant. Yeah. Just going on from that again, I watched him. Um, I've there's not a lot of stuff online with the with the Big Linda period, but I did watch yeah. the Shepherd's Bush um, or the yeah the Shepherd's Bush Empire gigs and the, the ones you got there. Yeah, give us some good moments from the the, the tours you did. And and I first saw you on the Stone God support tour. At oh Man yeah, yeah, Stone God. When you guys were amazing, I went and bought your album. I think. I think I, I don't remember, I don't know if you were at the desk or Rob, I can't remember for the life of me because it was a, it's about 10 or 15 years ago now. My memory's not where, that good. where was it? Manchester which, Academy which... 3. You know, the, uh, the bot, it's, it's, um, it's about three, two or 300 people. And anyway, you guys played an absolutely storming night. Uh, Out of the Darkness uh, is Dan, Dan Hawkins' other band. Dan Hawkins. Yeah. yeah. So I remember it. Yeah, I remember it. Yeah. And I remember buying the album, buying a stone, a big Linda T-shirt at the end, at the, at the night. I just remember I bought both items. So, but yeah, that, that was just a killer gig. But you always thought like you had such a great time live as well. Oh, it was, All yeah, I mean, it, it, it was, I mean, it was a, it was a dream sort of situation because, uh, you know, we didn't really, it was, it, it was like the opposite of feeder really, because feeder is very sort of like, rehearsed and organized and everything has to be you know the song the music is all about the songwriting and whereas the lindas were a lot more sort of like sort of cream or something you know yeah uh, much more jammy and soloy and things could happen and so when they did everybody was behind it you know it would go off and you know we would it, sometimes songs would last 10 minutes you know uh, yeah uh, and things would you know we'd go in, we'd take sections up uh, take things out take them as far as we could go uh, sometimes uh, which we all we all really liked doing which uh, it wasn't like you know it was a very much that was the the sort of dna of the band was to push things and experiment you know jimmy yeah. henry i mean like patrick murdoch the guitar players you know he's really one of the great guitar players um, and he's so free and uh you know inventive on the spot you know he can really you know he comes from a sort of blues yeah uh background he's a massive zeppelin uh chris whitley is another one of his big heroes as well so he's got an incredible finger picking style um but uh yeah great soloist great great ideas man you know great uh sort of try that what do you think of this throws it back at the band and then and then vets bass player you know one of the best finest bass players i've ever played with uh Big Jacob Pistorius weather report fan, you know, and he again improvising and 
he's got incredible ears and he can just back you up whatever's going on he's got it you know and then Rob would uh, do his dual microphone effects mic with real mic and he, so when, when he wasn't when it when all that was happening he'd get on the effects mic and yeah. fiddle around with that and create this psychedelic kind of you know thing which you know, it was great fun. It was it was great fun to play. Really, really amazing. Sometimes I, I, you know, I was thinking, how the hell did we get here? You know, yeah, and it sounds incredible. You know, it's just a uh, shame. I, I honestly, Jeff, I know I keep yeah. saying it, but it, it's just a shame that it didn't carry on because it was certainly one of my favourite albums of, of of all time. And I know it's you know it was a oh, nice shot in time, and it, it's great. So it'll always hold a fond memory. But no, that's, that's well, yeah. I mean, it would have been nice to have got another album out, uh, but uh, fortunately, it wasn't. To be, it wasn't to be. Uh, and you know what? And, if that's uh, your legacy, yeah. if I loved you is your legacy of Big Linda, then sometimes it's best just to let it be because. Yeah, yeah. Because if it, if you put, you know. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we were just we were just sort of channeling a a, a, a vibe. Really, uh, we we met. Um, it all got thrown together in a random way. It all sounded great. We didn't know why. It's not like we went out and picked, you know, hand picked a thing. It just <laughs> we all got thrown together. And uh, it, sorry, my nose. I'm getting blocked You've up got here. An absolutely but... stinking cold. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah. So it's nice that it happened, and we got the one record, and it's a good record. It is a good record. It's a good record. So going on to you personally. Who were your influences growing up as a drummer? You know, who were your biggest? Give us your, give us your five then. You said to you before you had your your favorite five drummers. Oh, top five. Your top five. Well, it's it's difficult. It's, it's actually you can't really do five. You got to go some seven. But All right, uh, give us your top seven then, Jeff. Go. On. I'll I'll let you have the seven. I'm usually stingy on numbers, me, but I'll, I'll be well, I'll no, give you seven. In no particular order, because these guys are the the greatest in my opinion and it's not a case of someone's better you know but you've got to uh, oh god it's so difficult um so yeah bonham buddy rich uh billy cobham stuart copeland oh right okay uh yeah definitely definitely uh, t- uh did i say tony williams you've not said tony williams yet no tony williams Dennis Chambers. Some classic drummers uh, there. Yeah. Uh, uh, Steve Gadd. That'll do. That's and seven. then, you know, that's my, that, that's my top seven. And and there's, you know, there's Ginger Baker and there's, there's you know, oh, Blakey and Max Roach. And, but I think as far as people that have really just done something that's completely game-changing and unique, those guys. Yeah. All inspired uh, you for, for for the reasons that you play drums. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, well, Phil Gould was for me. I mean, I, I, although I don't think he's top seven. Oh, God, I, he, I mean, he is in my mind. I mean, he's I absolutely love his uh, thing. You know, um, he really. When, when there was something about the way he played the drums when I heard Love Forty Two first time. Yeah, and just something about his uh, groove that just completely just stopped me in the tracks. I remember I just stopped, yeah. I was playing in, in, the, in the playroom at home and they, they came on TV, BBC Two, back in 1981 or something. And uh, and I just, oh God. And and, it, 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 and there was, whenever camera cut to him, he just had this way, he, I could just, I could just see what he was doing. He was trying to get this groove out uh, and he was doing it. And, and then he was, and then, you know, he was the sort of, foundation for mark king to be able to do all that stuff yeah uh, and, the, and the music i love the music as well you know those the, the chords they were using and the melodies it's very kind of quite really interesting music you know which i hadn't really heard before um and that was it I, awesome. he was the and then the, and then the next thing and then the next thing i went to see was go west live uh, right. <laughs> when i was a kid <laughs> and i just saw them the other night my friend, my, my friends, all the band now are friends of mine. And I haven't seen them for 37 years and I went to yeah. see them the other night. Uh, and that's another type of music that really got my ear, you know. Uh, and Alan Murphy, the original guitar player, he was phenomenal. Uh, I remember seeing them live. 
it was uh, Tony Beard drums, Graham Edwards bass. He went off to do Matrix in the uh, yeah. in the 90s. Avril Lavigne, he produced all that and wrote that stuff. Um, and then Alan Murphy on guitar. And he was, he tragically died many years ago. Um, but he played with Kate Bush and people like that. But he was this incredible mixture of kind of fusion-esque kind of rock a technique oh it was incredible uh and i remember him just blowing my mind when i saw saw them live so those two things really kind of made me want to sort of have a crack at these yeah. drums you know and then you mentioned <laughs> Stuart copeland as well um from from the police he, yeah i've got I, I do like the police i do like sting I, I love i love i can't play any sting on i can't play any police on guitar it's too hard. He's. I don't understand how on messaging a bottle, he, his fingers stretched to like that. Even just playing yes. that in India, uh, on, you know, uh, it's just too hard. I just don't understand how 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 it can be done. How Andy Summers done that, and for the drumming, the drumming in the the police is overall just a good band. You know, just good old rock and roll band. You know, really timeless stuff. You know, so yeah, it was the. Uh... You know, he he came up with a completely unique thing, and it and it really worked. He he was able to play it really well. It worked. You know, the reggae rock thing. Yeah. And uh, you know, whenever it comes on the radio or you know in a pub or something, you just I just I'm always in awe of just how beautiful uh, it sounds. You know, just three three piece band, drums, bass, uh, guitar, yeah, guitar, and then things that you know, super high pitched vocals over the top. But Copeland's just, you know, walking on the moon, messes in a bottle, you know, uh, um, every, every little thing she does, you know, yeah. some of them uh, driven to tears. That's a ridiculously good. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think cheer, of you know, drumming, drumming on that is really, really, try and play along with that. It's really tricky. Uh, the third one. He's just, he's just beautiful, just a beautiful player. I'm trying to think of the song. Oh, the Canary in a Coal Mine. You know, Canary in a Coal Mine. Yeah, you know. I think, I, I think he wrote that. It's Copeland. Oh right, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's a great that. little song. And you can tell that that's written. Yeah, because it's really groovy. It's really like. Yeah. yeah no, I can tell that. You can you tell that. that one or am I getting confused? We will check don't, it. Don't cut me on it. We will fact check it. Fact check it, yeah. We'll fact check it. So do, do, do a Joe Rogan Google it. <laughs> no, I'm not. Well, you know, I'll I'll have a look around and see if it if it is real. So so Jeff, I've come on to my fun question section. And I don't know if you've watched any other videos or you haven't, but this is the question where I ask you some 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 fun questions. So okay. this question is my favorite one of them all. Do you like gravy or curry on chips? Oh, what, curry sauce? Yeah, curry sauce. Uh, it depends. Uh, well, uh, curry sauce. I do like curry, curry sauce. sauce. Uh, yeah. Excellent. I like half rice, half chips curry sauce. I haven't had that for a long time, but when I last, but it's nice. It is nice. <laughs> Especially if you get fried rice. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, Cocoa Pops or Rice Krispies? Uh... I Rice Krispies. Rice Krispies. Do you put sugar on them? I, I don't really have cereal with milk. I don't like. I don't like milk. Oh, you don't like milk? Oh, okay. I'm a toast. I'm a toast guy. Okay, then you can have an additional bonus question: toast or crumpets? Uh, oh, that's difficult. <laughs> toast. I mean, I like both of those things. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I eat more toast than crumpets. Okay, fair enough. I eat more crumpets than toast, so I'll I'll, I'll go with that one. Uh, most famous person in your phone book? Oh God! Uh, oh, is it one of those where you've just got them all on speed dial, Jeff? Probably Chrissy Hyde. Oh wow, that's a good yeah. name. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've that's got a few of them. Yeah, she's pretty legendary. Yeah, that's pretty legendary. And you got Darby. You got Darby Todd. Darby told yeah, sorry. Hey, Good old Darby. <laughs> He's coming on in a couple of weeks when when he said he can reveal some stuff to me. It's exciting. <laughs> He's a great he did great a great guy. Fantastic player. Jesus. Yeah. Brilliant. And his album was really good that he released, wasn't it? 
Oh yeah, that was, <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. He's ridiculous. <laughs> I first met Darby. I've got to tell you the story. First met Darby at Water Rats when he was about fifteen years old, and I was playing up there with an old old band, and he was playing with uh, oh, what's his name now? William Will somebody Will 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 songwriter looks a bit like Roy Orbison. Uh, Don't anyway, I mean, he'll, he'll ask him. I think it, is it Will Dow? I can't remember the name. Anyway. Uh, are we, and uh, I went into the. Have you been to the Water Rats at King's Cross? No, no, not 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 really ventured down south. I'm a northerner. I'm from Manchester, so, yeah. so yeah. Well, okay, well, yeah, well, close enough. Water Rats is one of those venues where everybody has played there. You know, Muse used to play there to five people before they got signed. People, things like <laughs> one of the one of the toilets. I'll have to visit. So, I'll have to visit the Water yeah. Rats. Anyway, I was in there and. Uh, and I went into the uh, dressing room, and you couldn't get in for drums. It was just this drum kit was there, all set up. And uh, I was like, "Oh God, who's is, is, is this?" And then this little Darby said, "Oh, sorry, mate, it's uh, it's my drums. Yeah, but, you know, we had to put them there. We you know, take them on later." I said, "No, no it's fine." And then, uh, and it, and then I remember thinking, "Oh hell, you know, he's young." And then, uh, then we did our set, came off, and then they went on and, and, and they did theirs. And this kid. This fifty-year-old kid, the double bass drum pedal, <laughs> sounding like Vinnie Colliuta, was up there, and I just remember being, thinking, "Jesus, listen to this!" You know, and uh, I look at him now. Yeah, nice. no, he was he, he was brilliant. He's always been super, you know, it, he's like, just versatile, mega drummer. You know, yeah. he's a mega drummer. It is some of the stuff he puts on his face. He's a monster player. Yes, he's a monster player. Some of the stuff he puts on his Facebook, all these crazy time signatures. But just going down to a normal, straight, just rock and roll track, he can do that as well. well he makes so. it feel good. He, he makes it feel good. You know, he's a, he, he. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's tricky. But he he makes it, and he and he, and it, you know, he doesn't lose thing. He doesn't lose his head. You know, he's, he 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 fits it all in, and it feels good. He's an incredible, incredible player. You see it with Devin Devin Townsend. Yeah, I, I mean that's I watched it really on. tricky stuff. Yeah, you know, if if he. Let's go for one second. It's it's over, no. and, he, and he keeps the pressure on. Uh, no, on that music, amazing. It is amazing. It is amazing. So, yeah. the final question of my round of funny questions is: You're starting a band. I need one. Obviously, you'll be the drummer, Jeff. You filled the drum. Who are you having on guitar, bass, and vocals? What dream band? Your dream band. You're you're on drums. Who you having is your guitarist, your bassist, and your singer? Oh god. <laughs> uh bass player would probably have to be Jack of Pistorius. Uh guitar player would have to be Jimi Hendrix. Of course. Singer. Oof. Uh oh god, singer. I'm trying to Imagine who would sound good with that lineup. Or throw someone completely left field that would give it a really crazy vibe. John Lydon. Wow, that would be <laughs> insane. John Lydon and Jimi Hendrix. Who on could handle stage. it? Yeah, yeah. Hendrix, Pistorius, Holroyd, Lydon. Yeah, you can see that on a poster. Wow, that looks <laughs> that looks amazing. And there's a lot of hair going on as well, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> be a lot of hair going on. <laughs> Apart from Lydon, he'd be the, the odd looking one out. So, and then the, la the, the the next question I was going to ask you is, tell me a funny story from tour. Um, there's been some interesting stories recently, so you can certainly top it, I think. Judging by the people you've played with and... Interesting tour stories. Oh, I put me on the spot there. Uh... Or something funny. Funny's always good. Okay. Uh, we did, going back to Chrissy, I did a record with Chrissy once uh, and, and a tour. Um, and it was a thing called JP, Chrissy and the Fairground Boys. Right. And we, we toured America. Uh, and uh, the Jeff, the driver, his name was Jeff, I can't remember saying that, that, our bus driver. And it's one of those amazing American tour buses, big, spacious yeah. thing. Uh, 
he started laughing. We pulled up to the venue, and he started laughing, at, 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 and we could hear. Him. I was sort of sat near the where the you know the door to the driver's cab yeah. was, and he's like giggling like a child. And I, I, was, I was like, "What's what is this?" Because he had a great sense of humour. He, he had all kinds of jokes. Some of them definitely couldn't say you know here, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, I went into put my head in, and I said, and he, he was you know, bent double laughing, and he just pointed up to the marquee uh, above the uh, you know the entrance, and it said JP Chrissy and the Farmhouse Boys, <laughs> <laughs> and he just, somebody got it wrong, and uh, and I I just fell about laughing as well because it was supposed to be Fairground Boys and it was Farmhouse Boys, <laughs> and then I started doing a chicken impression, <laughs> and that made him really go, and then. Uh, and then JP came in. And he said, "Hey, what's so funny?" And I was like, "I said, look at that." And he got really, he was really pissed off. He said, "That's not the name. That's terrible. Oh, who, somebody's going to, you know, heads are going to roll for this, you know." And then that <laughs> made it even funnier. The fact that he was not finding it funny made it even funnier. You know, like it's like back back at school when something oh, wow. the teacher did not find funny. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a funny story. Yeah. It reminds me of that moment of the of the Apprentice recently, where they've uh, they spell Arctic wrong, as in like the Arctic, and they spell it Arctic A R C A R C, no A R C, yeah Arctic A R A R T I C, as in like Arctic lorry instead of like the Arctic. Amazing, yeah, Just yeah, horrendous spelling and and shocking. So, <laughs> so <laughs> right, well. Jeff, I'm I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, firstly, thank you very much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Some really great stories there, and um, I love the little snippet about Derby. That's that's wonderful. I'm gonna I'm gonna probe him later about his 37 piece drum kit later on in the year. Good luck with the feeder tour. Um, good luck with anything else that you're doing. You've got anything else in the middle, or is it just all feeder for the rest of the year, or anything else exciting that you could tell the channel? Uh, well, there's actually there's three albums coming out this year which I played on. Uh, okay. One of them is Torpedo. Yeah. Uh, then there's another artist called A.A. A. Williams. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. She's a sort of death gospel, I think she's described as. Death uh, gospel? Wow. I'll uh, have to check that uh, out. A.A. <laughs> A. 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 Williams. Yeah. Uh, uh, Alex Williams. Uh, I did, I've done an album her first album and then her second one is coming out and her first EP as well. Right. But second album's coming out. It's really good. Uh, she's an incredible singer, writer, piano player, guitarist. Her husband is bass player, Tom. Uh, it's the two of them. And uh, it's really, it's really haunting, uh, inca uh, really encapsulating music. Right. Okay. Uh, so that, that album's coming out. Uh, and then there's, an, and then there's Gilbert O'Sullivan. I did his, New latest record. Right, okay. He's an old, from, I don't say old guy. He's a classic. Uh, uh, I mean, seventy four years old. He's you know, but he's he was huge in the uh, back in the seventies. Right, an amazing songwriter, and he he wrote fourteen tunes which we recorded with Patrick from Big Linda, uh, the guitar player, yeah. and some other guys at Rack Studio in the uh, last summer. So that's coming out, I think, soon. And he's got a duet with Nick Hucknall and a duet Katie Tunstall on it. Oh wow! So, uh, so yeah, so that's going to be a, a, a great record. It's a great record. We played it all live together, no click tracks. Uh, I think we did use click a couple of times, but mainly it's just free flowing live. And he sat looking at me on the piano, literally about <laughs> you know, four feet in front of the drums, just playing because he likes to look at the drummer. And uh, he has this way of playing the left hand ch chops the piano like that. Amazing changes and amazing lyrics he's you know he's up there with McCartney uh, really in his writing so uh, yeah that's going to be a great album so that, so that those are the three things coming out this year which are, which awesome well again Jeff thanks very much for coming on thanks for those little nuggets of extra information so check out those other other musicians I will um, I'll put some links in the in, in in the chat when this is out guys so so thanks for coming on mate I really appreciate it yeah. And it was it was an absolute pleasure. See you yeah, soon. Likewise. All right. That's bye bye. See you later.